All right, well, if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and grab that and open it up to Romans chapter 7. We are uh, continuing our series in the book of Romans, and uh, we're getting ready to, to come to a pause in our series where we're going to take a uh, several-month break out of the book of Romans uh, because we've got a couple of other things that we want to make sure that we touch on here before the end of the year and then as we move in to the new year. And so uh, after next week, we'll finish Romans chapter 7, and so we'll, it'll be a good stopping point for us before we dive into the gargantuan that Romans chapter 8 is. Uh, looking forward to that, but it's going to be a couple of months before we actually get into that because we're going to uh, take a, a quick break and we've got a series that we do every year here at the Ridge called Planting Trees, uh, which comes out of Jeremiah chapter 3, but we're going to uh, dive into some things that are important for us as a church, uh, as part of our, our values and our vision and, and where the Lord is leading us together as a church, and so uh, we'll do that in the month of November, and then we move in at the very end of November, we move into Advent. So uh, we just turn our attention to the incarnation of Christ and the coming of Jesus uh, through uh, through his birth and uh, around our Christmas time. And so excited about that. And then when we get into uh, when we get into the uh, new year, we're going to uh, take a, a little detour uh, before we dump back into Romans. Do I need to get, get this mic here? OK. All right. Sorry. A little microphone change. I apologize. All right, here we go. How about a little better? All right, good deal, good deal. Uh, I hate these things, by the way, because I can't use my hands. I'm a, I'm a hands person, and so these, these handhelds are not fun for me. Um, so, hey, uh, if you, ha again, a Bible, Romans chapter 7, uh, right now, if you have your YouVersion Bible app, you can use that uh, as well. And so just uh, click on more and then events, and you'll see all of today's notes right there. But, um are you, you don't have to raise your hand for this, but I, I don't know about you, but I am a, uh, I'm a fan of the television show The Office, and it's one of those things that, that I, you know, I watch just kind of like even in the background sometimes, just kind of just have it playing in the background just to have some noise going on sometimes, but um, as I was preparing this message this week, uh, one of the episodes actually came to mind, and it was the episode when Michael Scott, who's the main character, so if you're not an Office fan, like this will still make sense to you, but Michael Scott had uh, found himself in a bit of a financial pickle. All right. He'd gotten into some financial trouble through some bad decisions and those kinds of things. And so he's stressing out. And he's trying to figure out, it's like, how, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to, like, what can I do? And so he gets the idea that he is going to declare bankruptcy. Right. And so he's sitting in his office and he comes to this decision conclusion. I'm going to I'm going to declare bankruptcy. And so he walks out into the main office and it, with a loud voice, he just screams to everybody. I declare bankruptcy. Right. And Oscar looks at him and goes, it's not how that works. <laughs> Like his, his, he thought that he could just stand up and declare bankruptcy and all of his financial issues, all of his financial problems were just going to go away, right? And, of course, Oscar it was just like, bro, that's, that's not how that works at all. And so just because you declare something to be true doesn't mean that it is true. So, right, there, there needs to be an explanation of, of how something works, now, the Apostle Paul makes a similar surprising statement. Last week, we, we touched on this in Romans chapter 6, verse 14. He says something that probably not as surprising to us, like it should be. It should, it should be really surprising to us. But for the original readers of this letter to Rome, it would have been really surprising for them because what Paul says to them in verse 14 of Romans chapter 6 is he says, you are no longer under the law, but under grace. And again, for you and I, like, that doesn't necessarily blow us down because maybe we're just, I don't, maybe we don't think about it in the same way, but for the original readers of this letter, they would have been like, say what? 
I mean, it, it would have been it would have been huge to them because the Mosaic law or the, or the law, if you will, that was everything to them. And so the, all of these questions would would start to like flood over them. Like, so do we not need to follow the law? Does the law not matter anymore? What do you mean by that? We're not under the law. What, like, if, well, I think we're still under the law, but now we're under grace and we're not under the law. Paul, what do you mean by that? And so unlike Michael's misguided declaration, this statement has a profound meaning. And yet, as the readers, the Jewish readers of that would have maybe even said, just like Oscar, that's not how that works. It can't work that way, right? Yet Paul goes on to explain in Romans chapter 7, these first six verses that we're going to unpack together today, that when we put our faith in Christ, something new happens. Something new happens. We are free from the law's condemnation and, and now live by the Spirit's transforming power. And so Romans 7 invites us to experience this new kind of obedience, if you will. Not driven by rules, but by the Spirit's transforming power. So let me read to us Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 1. We're just going to look at these six verses together this morning. We're going to go about that long. All right. Um, since I'm speaking, this is what Paul says. He says, since I'm speaking to those who know the law, brothers and sisters, don't you know that the law rules over someone as long as he lives? For example, a married woman is legally bound to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law regarding the husband. So then, if she is married to another man while her husband is living, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. Then if she is married to another man, she is not an adulteress. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. You belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions aroused through the law were working in us to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us so that we may serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the old letter of the law. So what I want to do for just a couple of minutes is I, I think this uh, passage breaks down into three sections, and then at the end we'll follow that up with uh, a little bit of application as to, to how do we just apply this? How do we live this out? And so the first thing that we see, number one, if you want to take notes or like to take notes, the first thing that we see is we see freedom from the law's condemnation. Freedom from the law's condemnation. And so Paul starts by saying that the law has authority over a person as long as that person is alive, right? As long as the, the person is, is living, the law has authority over them. But this authority, it, it's only limited to this life. And so when a person dies, like death cancels it. Death delivers you from the common obligations. And so the way that he explains this and illustrates that is through the illustration of marriage. He says that when a, when a man is, is, is married to a woman and they are married together, then there is a legal obligation for them to one another, right? They are, they are legally obligated to one another. There is a, a legal obligation, but there's also a relational obligation there, right? It's, it's not just legal obligation. There's relational obligation there. But he's just using the, the, the legality of it to paint the easy picture to say that when one of the spouses dies, that person is now freed from that legal obligation. Like it, it's legally okay for the living spouse to marry another, right? It's a very simple, straightforward obligation, but he's using that illustration to say that's how it is with the law. That as a person is living in the sense of they are living in the flesh, right? They Before they have come to know Christ, before they begin to follow Christ and have been saved by Christ, then they are legally bound and obligated to the law. But a death for the Christian, a death has taken place. And because a death has taken place, 
you are no longer under law, but now under grace. This is the picture that he's painting. And so in the same way, believers are free from the obligation of the law because as believers, when we put our faith in Christ, the life that we once lived is no longer. And so I think Paul does a really good job of explaining this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. He says this, he says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then he says this, he says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. So Paul, Paul is essentially saying, he's saying that, hey, look, if if the righteousness that we have, the right standing that we have before God, if the only way that we have that right standing before God is by us trying to perfectly keep the law, then Jesus Christ died on the cross for nothing. It was worthless. It didn't matter. It shouldn't have happened. You can put all your faith that you want into him. It does not matter if that, keeping the law, being obligated to the law, if that is what brings righteousness. He says, Christ died for nothing. We've been crucified with Christ, and it is I who no longer lives. And so this may, this may actually bring up a couple of questions for you and, and for me. And the first question is, is pretty simple. It's like, okay, what law are we talking about exactly? Like, what, what, is, what is this this law, and so we're talking about the the Mosaic law. But if you want to just simplify that down even further, if this is helpful, just think the Ten Commandments. Okay, that's part of the Mosaic law. That's the the Mosaic law simplified, right? Is is the commandments, uh, the the Ten Commandments, if you will, right? And so uh, so that's what we're talking about is these, which brings up maybe a second question. Is is Paul saying then that since we are no longer bound to the law, that we are no longer under the law, but we are under grace, does the law even matter? Like, do these commandments, are they, like, should we even try to keep them? I mean, last I checked, like, don't kill someone is a pretty good one that we should probably still keep. Um <laughs> In the first service this morning, I said that, and, and somebody from the back goes, well, maybe. I was like, we need to check your freezer, buddy. Like, <clears throat> but, but I think, like, like, don't murder is a pretty good law to keep around, right? And so the, the law still has its place, but the point that Paul is making is the, the, that the law or following the law isn't meant to save you because it can't. It won't. No matter how well you could, you could, you won't, you could keep it perfectly and it still would not save you. Still would not bring you salvation. The law is meant to show us our sin. And in fact, that's what Paul says next in verse 7 of this chapter. And we'll cover, we'll dive into this more in depth next week. But he says this, he says, what should we say then? Is the law sin? He says, N- absolutely not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. It's like, how do I know that I'm not supposed to steal? Because the law says what? Don't steal, right? That's how we know. How does a, how does a child, how does, how, does, how does your kids know what the, the law of the house is, the rules of the house are? Because you tell them what it is, right? And when they break it, when they rebel against it, when they go against it, they know that, hey, this is not within the confines of the rules because we remind them, or at least we should, right? And so Paul is saying the law really, the law really works like a mirror is what the law works as. And so the law only exposes sin because if the law says don't steal and you steal, then you've broken the law. Again, Paul continues in Galatians. I think, again, he he explains this in greater detail. He says this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. He says, is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? 
Absolutely not. But Paul likes to do that. He likes to ask these rhetorical questions and then answer them, right? He says, for if the law had been granted with the ability to give life, or in other words, if the law had been granted and given in order to save us, to bring us salvation, he said, then righteousness would certainly be on the basis of the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law. We were, again, under law, not under grace. He said, imprisoned until the faith, uh, until coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian until Christ, so that we could be justified by faith. Since, but since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. And so John Stott, theologian John Stott, I think adds a little more color to this. We'll, we'll move on, but he says this. He says he explains that, that freedom from the law is not an invitation to sin, but it's liberation from its crushing burden, he says. He continues, he writes, he says, We are not free from the obligation to obey God, but we are free from the old burdensome way of trying to obey through human effort. When I was younger, I, um, I, used to, I used to love to hike. I still love to hike. I just don't get an opportunity to do it as much. But when I was younger, I got to do it a lot, and so I really enjoyed doing that. And um, when I was in college, some uh, friends of mine together, we decided that we were going to hike the Tennessee portion of the Appalachian Trail. Now, I'd hiked before. I'd done a couple of overnighters, nothing, nothing big, nothing long like this. And so we were going to take our spring break, and that's, that's what we were going to do. And so we did. We prepared for it. We planned for it. You know, we bought all the gear that we needed for it. Um, one thing that I failed to do, however, in this process was try to figure out how to hike lightly. And so I had this huge hiking bag, right? Like, I mean, the Joker was like this tall. Like, it's huge, right? And so I just wanted to, like, I think probably just mostly look the part, right? Look like I knew what I was doing. And so I did not apparently know what I was doing because what I also packed in the bag was a lot of canned food. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, I don't know why that made sense to me because it, it just filled the bag like with heaviness. And so this bag literally weighed the bag before I left, and the bag weighed 65 pounds. And so I was going to hike for five days with 65 pounds on, which isn't a ton, but when you're hiking up and down a mountain for five, six days, that's a lot, right? And so I'm putting this bag on, and I'm hiking, and I'm probably like a quarter mile into this hike, and I'm going, I'm going to have to get rid of some of this stuff. Like, this is, this is not... This is not good. This, this is heavy, right? And so by the time we made it to the first shelter the first evening, that was exactly what I did. Is I opened that bag up, and I started chunking stuff in the trash, right? Like I was just like, I don't, I'm not taking this. I don't need this. we got to get rid of this. Hey, you want this? You can have it, right? Like, so I'm like just getting rid of stuff because I'm trying to lighten the load of this bag. The thing that, that, that Paul is, is painting the picture of here and what he is trying to explain here is that, that better than that, 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 Christ, that, that Christ doesn't take the burden of the law and the heaviness of that and just go, hey, let me remove some stuff out of here. It's still going to be a little heavy. It's still going to be a little tough, but let me take a few things out of here for you and give it back to you. That's not the picture that he's painting. The picture that he's painting is, is he's saying, give me the bag. Give me the bag. I'll carry it. Put it on me. I'll carry this load. You don't have to carry it any longer. It's been placed on my shoulders. And so to be under the law means that we must do something for God. But to be under grace means that God has done something for us. There's a big difference there. And so we are free from laws, the law's condemnation. This is the freedom that Paul is describing. The second thing that we see is we see a union with Christ leads to fruitfulness. Being united to Christ leads to fruitfulness. Look at what verse 4 
says here in chapter 7. He says this, he says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. Again, he's kind of coming out of this marriage illustration and saying that metaphorically a spouse has died. You are free from the obligation of that, but you have been united to another. You've been united to Christ is what he's saying. So the the death of the flesh has happened, but you have been united to life in the spirit is the illustration that Paul is painting. He says, through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another. You belong to him who was raised from the dead. We're talking about Jesus. In order, he says, why? In order that we may bear fruit for God. And so Paul extends the illustration by saying that, that the now free spouse has, has remarried, and we died to the obligation of the law, but have been united to Christ. And so being united to Christ doesn't produce more rules to follow. It produces what the scripture calls fruit. So it's not more rules to follow. Like, like if you look at your relationship with Jesus, or maybe you're you're kind of uh, on the outside looking in and you've not given your life over to Christ, you've not asked the Lord to, to save you, and you kind of look at the, the life of a Christian, the life of a believer, you, you look at that and you go, man, it's just it's just a lot of rules. Like it just feels like a lot of things that I got to do, and I got to do this, and I got to be this, and all of these things, just all of these rules, I don't know if I, like, that just feels hard. Paul's like, it's not, it's not that. It is not that at all. You are united to Christ, not to be given more rules to have to follow, but so that you will bear fruit. That there is something that the Spirit of God produces in you that comes out of you. It's what comes out of us as we follow Jesus. In fact, listen to these words of Jesus himself. John chapter 15, Jesus talks about this very thing. He says this in verse 4. He says, remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. And then he says this, you've probably heard this before. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. Why? Because you can do nothing without me. Jesus himself, he's saying, you can't produce the fruit of the Spirit without the Spirit producing the fruit. The, the goodness, the kindness, the, uh, th- these things, they, they don't come out of you without me and you being connected to one another like a branch is connected to a vine, like the vine gives life to the branch. You cut a branch off from a tree and lay it in the grass, what happens? It dies. There's no fruit. You don't get apples from a branch laying on the ground. It's got to be connected to the source of life. And then listen to what he says. We skip, skip over to verse 8 here in, in chapter 15. Jesus concludes this thought. He says, my father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Tim Keller talks about this and explains that, that when we follow Jesus, when we are united to Christ like a branch to a tree, he, he says this, he says, what flows from us is not more rules. What comes out of us, he's saying, it's, it's, it's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's kindness, faithfulness, gentleness. He says, but if the branch is cut off, if it's not connected to the source, to the tree, no amount of effort can make that branch produce life. No amount of effort can make a branch that has been cut off from a tree produce any kind of fruit. And this is what Paul is saying about the law. No amount of perfection of keeping the law will produce any kind of life out of you. There's no fruit. 
And so being united with Christ leads to fruitfulness. Then the last thing that we see in these last two verses is we see what it means to be living in the Spirit's power. To be living in the Spirit's power. Look look back in Romans 7, verses 5 and 6. He says this. He says, For when we were in the flesh, meaning before we had been saved by God, when we were living in the flesh, the sinful passions aroused through the law, were working in us to bear fruit for death. But now, but now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us. Why? So that we may serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the old letter of the law. And so again, the question is, do we just ignore the moral law of God. We just like throw it aside. It's it's not necessary. If we're not going to keep it perfectly anyway, do we even need it? What's it there for? So what was once used as a way for us to, to try and earn some kind of favor with God is now something that we do out of love for God. So keeping the law, following, following the law, or again, just if you just want to say just the, the commandments of God, doing those, that we don't do those because we have to. We do those because we get to. We don't do them because we have to. We do them because we get to. And so just like in a marriage, you don't do things for your spouse as an obligation, or at least I hope that you don't. Right? You, you, you serve them, you love them, you sacrifice for them, you do whatever you can to please them because you love them. You don't have to, but you get to. You don't have to serve God. You get to serve God. You don't, you don't have to show up here on a Sunday morning and, and worship. You get to show up here on a Sunday morning and worship. Like, you know, don't raise your hand for this, but think about it. How many of us came in this morning going, oh, I got to go to church. I got to go to church. I got to go serve in the kids' ministry. I got to serve coffee today. I got to play in, I, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this. Or did you go, man, I get to go and worship and sing and open the word together and be with brothers and sisters. Like, I get to do that. Or did you have to do this? I want you to hear me when I say this. God does not need your have to. He wants your get to. He doesn't need your have to. He said, you know what? If if, if you won't cry out, I'll make these rocks sing. If it's going to be a have to, they get to. Is following Jesus, it, has it felt more like a have to or a get to? You don't, you don't have to open the word and read it, but you get to. You don't have to be generous, but you get to. You don't have to serve, but you get to. You don't have to follow the commands of God. You get to follow them. John Piper writes this. He says, he says why did we die to the law? Why are, we, why are we released from the law? Why are we not under the law? So that we may sin all the more? Live any way that we want to live? Do whatever we want to do? He says, no. So that we may serve. And then he said, I love what he says next. He says, death to the law makes servants, not sinners. Death to the law makes servants, not sinners. So what do we do? How do we, how do we just, how do we take these words from Paul and how do we, how do we just apply it to our lives and look, look for uh, the, the ways that this, that this just applies to us in a, in a practical sense? I think there are 
I think there are four things, just really quickly. Four things. First thing is this, is I think that that we have to seek to abide in Christ daily. It's a daily submission to the Spirit. Like each day that, that we start our day, we start our day with submission to the Holy Spirit, to the Spirit of God, to the Spirit's leading of our day. Not just like, like if you look at the if you look at the macro, the big picture, right? Like we we would, if you're a Christ follower, we would say, man, I, I want the I want the Spirit of God, I want the Holy Spirit to lead my life. Yes and amen. That's awesome. But how often do we just go, Spirit, will you lead my actions today? Spirit, will you lead my words today? Spirit, will you lead my thoughts today? Spirit, will you lead Will you lead my day? Will you lead my path today? Right? A daily submission to the Spirit. Do you know why that's important? It's because everything in the sinful part of your unsanctified flesh that is still there fights against the Spirit every day. And so there has to be a daily submission to the Spirit. So abiding in Christ daily, allowing Christ to, to shape your heart. So I think that's one way. I, I, I think the second way, as we learn from what Paul has written here, is that, that we need to recognize and reject any little bits of legalism that is in our heart. Legalism is, is, is interesting because I was having a conversation with somebody after the first service this morning. We were kind of talking about legalism. Legalism is, um, it, it, you know, essentially, like if we wanted to simplify it, legalism would, be, would, would say, hey, you know what, like, um, I need to. I need to follow. Uh, I need to follow this way and that way, and I need to be this and I need to be that. And if I'm not this and I'm not that, then I'm just. I'm just not right. Like, like it's got to be this way. Or legalism might be something like where you know we say, well, you know, uh, you, you can't preach in tennis shoes. You know, it's got to be, you know, whatever, right? You can't wear, you know, jeans. You got to wear a dress. You got to wear a tie. Like, like that's that's forms of legalism. And if you ask why, well, why is that? Well, it's got to be that way because God says that we got to give him our best. As Oscar would say, that's not how that works. But legalism, legalism finds its way out of us in, I think, well-meaning types of ways. Should we want to give God our best? Absolutely. Like all the time and everything that we do. Like, we should, but is that what that means? That's not what that means. And so, like, when we think of, like, w when you feel the need to earn God's favor through rules, remind yourself of the gospel. Christ has already fulfilled the law on your behalf. In fact, it's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. He says, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but to complete, to fulfill the law, he says. So maybe, maybe one thing that we do even here as we, we close our time together here in just a few moments is that, that we just ask the Lord to search our heart for any hidden bits of legalism in our hearts so that we would lay it before him and repent. Two more and I'll be done. I think the, the third thing that we see as application from this text is that, uh, that we are called to, to walk by the Spirit, to live by the Spirit. It's what Paul says here in the end of, of chapter 6. He says, so that we may serve in the newness of the Spirit. And when you see the word walk in the Scripture, what, uh, what you're seeing, what, what is being said is, uh, is more or less to live shaped by the Spirit of God, right? To walk in the newness of life. To walk means to, to live or to be shaped by the Spirit of God. And so, again, what if you start each day by asking the Spirit to guide your thoughts, to guide your words and, and actions, and to be sensitive to throughout the day to the leading of the Spirit in your life? 
sensitive meaning that, that your ears are open to, to the leading of the Spirit in your life on a daily, moment-by-moment moment basis. That is also abiding in Christ daily, right? And then I think the last thing is, is just simply this, and we already talked about it, but, but it's, choosing, it's choosing get to over have to. Choosing get to over have to. Like, how, how, how would it change? How would it change your heart to think of all the duty that Christ calls us to, the commands that he calls us into as his followers, that if we looked at those as not things that we have to do, but things that we get to do, Not have to do, but get to do. Like we we get to gather with brothers and sisters in community together to worship. We get to do that. We don't have to do that. We get to do it. And I get to, to open my mouth and sing praise and worship and sing songs of exultation to a holy God. I get to do that. I don't have to do that. I get to do that. And I, I get to be generous. I get to give. I get to do it joyfully. I get to do it sacrificially. I get to do it generously. I get to do those things. Like, how would it change your heart to think of these things instead of going, man, I... You know, if Alyssa came and walked in on a Sunday and goes, man, I got, I got to serve them dirty, rotten kids this morning. Alyssa leads our preschool ministry, by the way. But instead, she comes in and she says, no, I get to do this. I get to do this. Brittany walks in with our elementary kids and she goes, man, I, I get to do this. I don't have to do this. I get to do this. Lindsay walks up here on stage and begins to sing, and, and, and it's not a have to. I get to. I'm telling you, it, it, it changes. It, it'll, it'll change everything for you. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. He says, for you were called to be free, brothers and sisters, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, the, the context of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul is he's talking about generosity, but it, if you understand the, the, the true like meaning of generosity, generosity from the New Testament scripture, generosity is not that thing that just comes out of our wallet, it's actually what, so much worse than that. It's, it's what comes out of our heart. Like generosity is, is with our lives. It's not with the, just our money. Like for some of us in the room, like if generosity was just giving money, yeah, that's easy. You do that. You do it all day, which I highly recommend you should do. But um, I'm kidding. But, like, but, that, but you, could, you could just do that over and over and over and over again and go, look at how generous I am. Look at how generous I am. And Paul goes, it's way worse than that. It's not just your money. It's not what comes out of your wallet. It's what comes out of your heart. It's what comes out of your, it, it's, it, it's what comes out of your life. And so he says this, he says, each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly, or your translation say, uh, not begrudgingly or out of compulsion since God loves a cheerful giver. get to you get to so I close with this I, again I, I I find I find Tim Keller helpful here but he says this he says being married to Christ is the final answer to the question can a Christian live as he or she chooses just do whatever you want he says, no, because we are in love with Christ. We are in love with Christ. And so as we close, we're going we're gonna to sing together. 
we're going to worship together, and we're going we're gonna to have a moment where we get to receive communion together. I think communion is a beautiful picture of get to over have to. Jesus willingly submitted himself to the Father to get to lay down his life for us. Scripture says it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. And we get to be reminded of that. We get to celebrate that. We get to receive that. And we get to do it together. So as we close, as we sing together, it's simply I want us to pray, and I I want you to take a few moments, maybe even to just ask the Lord to search your own heart on these things. Lord, help me with these things. Help me abide in you daily. Help me submit to the Spirit daily. Help me, if there's any legalism in my heart where where I've tried to just to, to be perfect or to be this or to be that and, and to, to connect myself to the law instead of just knowing that I'm under your grace. Father, show me. Father, if I've had an attitude of have to, help change my heart to get to. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we pray. God, I, I pray. Lord, that the message that has been heard, Father, was much more effective than the one that was spoken. So, Father, that, that you would take your word and sink it deep into our hearts. God, that fruit would come forward. God, that transformation would happen. God, as your word reminds us and shows us that, that transformation is from the inside out. It's not about outside effort. It's about inward transformation. So, Father, as we, as we may even struggle to submit, Lord, that, that you would help us uncross our arms. God, to, to open, the, open the defense of our heart, Lord, God, so that we would be changed and touched by you that you would help us, that you would show us, that you would lead us, that you would mold us and shape us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.